The Senior Rehab Project is supported by The Game Changers, a group of motivated rehab clinicians that are crushing mediocrity and advancing care for older adults. You can join this group of people and get access to the private Facebook group, the monthly meetup with article discussions, and have a say in the direction of this movement. Get off the sidelines and get involved. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com forward slash Game Changers. Hit me! This is a Senior Rehab Podcast, the podcast for rehab clinicians that want to better serve older adults. Hey there, Senior Rehab Podcast listeners. I'm Erin Carey. And I'm Sally Spaceman. And you're listening to SR Prerex. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an episode that is also included in our series on ageism. Mm-hmm. Yay, ageism. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes, they are available on, on whatever app you're listening to us right now or on our Facebook group. Yeah. Or also on SeniorRehabProject.com. Mm-hmm. I think so. We are very available. <laughs> All right, so the article that we are going to be discussing on SR Prerex today is entitled Positive Age Beliefs Protect Against Dementia, Even Among Elders with High Risk Gene. Yo! I know. I know, right? Uh, Yo, that's awesome. Well, just you wait, because it is. Regardless, so it's actually by our personal hero, Professor Becca Levy. So she's a professor of public health at Yale. She testified before the U.S. Senate on the effects of ageism, and she contributes to briefs submitted to the U.S. Supreme Court in age discrimination cases. She's been conducting research on ageism since the mid-90s and was one of the authors on the China versus USA memory performance study that we talked about in the episode about Nelson's article, so the first article on ageism. Mm -hmm. On Wikipedia, it states that she is a leading researcher in the fields of social gerontology and psychology of aging. She has conducted foundational research on how self-stereotypes operate and how older individuals are influenced by and can influence their societies. I'm excited. Let's go. She's so cool. <laughs> she is. I really just want to have a drink with her and, and record it. And I would love that. Is or it... just have a drink with her. <laughs> is it weird to have heroes who are professors at Yale? <laughs> <laughs> like, what does my life become? <laughs> my life makes no sense to me now. <laughs> That's just the first author. The other authors are Martin Slade. He and Levy often publish together. He is also at Yale. He's also a researcher. And his interests include older persons' perceptions of aging, influencing their cognition and health. And he's also into hearing loss, but NBD. Uh, the third author is Robert Pietzak. He is also at Yale. He researches epidemiology of trauma-related disorders across the lifespan, and his interests include geriatric mental health and the role of stress in dementia and a lot of other cool stuff. The last author is Luigi Ferrucci. He is a geriatrician slash epidemiologist who researches progressive physical and cognitive decline in older persons, and he's also the director of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. So those are the authors of this article, and I thought it was important to give a little bit of background information. Oh, I also wanted to say... That this was published in February 2018. So this is like That's brand, like brand new, like sparkly. Like, hey, we just published this. Come. Surprise. Yeah. 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 Hey, here, this is just for your, your series on ageism. Thanks, Dr. Levy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a little stats heavy, but I promise to hold your hand through it all. Yay. If my hand <laughs> is held, I'm fine. Yeah, I got you. So first, really quick, Alzheimer's disease slash dementia is a buildup of beta amyloid aggregates in the brain. Alzheimer's disease specifically makes up 60 to 70 percent of dementia, and the initial symptoms are often mistaken for normal aging. So that's all I want to say about Alzheimer's disease. I feel like most of the listeners have a pretty good background on what Alzheimer's is and what it means for a person. However, if you are not one of those people, you can always go to alz.org. It's an official Alzheimer's website that has a lot of good information. So the article was about Alzheimer's specifically or dementia? Dementia. Okay. But what they talk about is a high-risk gene called the APOE Epsilon 4 Mm -hmm. gene. Yeah. We're going to call it APOE 4. APOE 4. Yes. So I got this information from Wikipedia, admittedly. I love Wikipedia. I know people poo-poo on it, but I don't care. I love Wikipedia. I think that when I when I graduated, I donated to Wikipedia because uh, heck yes, and I do implore everybody to donate it. You know, if you use it, if yeah, uh, it is important to f- fact check after. 
like you know for, for if you deep, have time no for deeper things like i would never i do not think that if you have a presentation for school for if you're presenting in pt school you should quote wikipedia because oh yeah no that's tacky that's that's just you didn't do your job um yeah lazy but, but yeah, podcasts are different yeah no and wikipedia <laughs> is awesome it's yes, I the agree. fact that knowledge is so accessible today is amazing we live in a magical time we do, and I don't think we appreciate it. We don't appreciate that some people don't have that. Sorry, that was my two cents about Wikipedia. I really, if even someone would donate $10 after this podcast, it would make me very happy. Okay, well, plug for Wikipedia. Maybe we should see if they want to sponsor us. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So according to Wikipedia... Apolipoprotein E is a fat binding protein that is part of the chylomicron in intermediate density lipoproteins all over the body. In the peripheral tissues, I'm sorry, we're getting a little biochem right now, or at least like bio, cell bio. Sorry, guys. But I feel like this is important. Just, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, Epo E4. Yes. Apolipoprotein E in the peripheral tissues is produced by the liver and macrophages, and it mediates cholesterol metabolism. That's less important for what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. But just know it's not just in the brain. So in the central nervous system, it's made by astrocytes, and it transports cholesterol to the neurons, which is important for their cell membranes and all sorts of fun things. It is the principal cholesterol carrier in the brain, and it also enhances breakdown of beta amyloid within and between the cells. And that same beta amyloid, which is an aggregate in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, that's very important to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So the genes that code for apolipoprotein E are polymorphic, and there are three major allele types. So E2 is related to atherosclerosis. It's not very common. And there's some evidence to suggest it may actually provide a protective effect against Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Just suggesting evidence, not any like causal link. Epsilon 3 is just considered neutral. It neither increases or decreases your risk for Alzheimer's disease. Epsilon 4 is implicated in atherosclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, impaired cognitive function, HIV, faster progression of multiple sclerosis, poor outcomes post-TBI, ischemic cerebrovascular disease, sleep apnea, and a bunch of other stuff. Now, I do want to say implicated does not mean a causal relationship. Genetics are complicated. Yeah, they are. And they are unfair. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If only. <laughs> Yeah, it also has to do with MS, right? With the progression of MS? It makes the progression of MS faster. Yeah. Yeah. So just to recap, we know apolipoprotein E is important. The epsilon-4 polymorphism is bad, okay? Mm, they're bad, okay? They're not good for your brain, okay? Ageism is bad, okay? I've wanted to call the series Ageism's Bad, okay? <laughs> Oh my god, we're too late now. Oh yeah, we're way too late. We will call the next one. <laughs> something if we do something that's bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Calls are bad, okay? Okay. All right. So the Epsilon 4 variant. It is the largest known genetic risk factor for late onset sporadic Alzheimer's disease in many ethnic groups, such as Nigerian black people, which they have the highest observed frequency of the gene. However, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease is super rare. So that kind of highlights like, just because you have the gene does not mean you're going to have Alzheimer's. Cool. Also, remember when when people say about the the prevalence of, of a certain disease? Yes. It's the reported ones. Yeah. In some cultures, because people think, oh, it's just part of aging, they don't report it. I'm not saying that that's what happens in Nigerians, but it does happen in some cultures. Absolutely. And also, Nigerians are extremely diverse. I actually, one of my coworkers is Nigerian, and she was telling me about how there are like 200 different languages and all these different tribes. So I, I didn't look into the source material for that statistic, but, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. So then, although it has a really high observed frequency of the Epsilon-4 variant in Nigerian Black people... In Caucasian and Japanese people, if they have the two E4 variants, they are 10 to 30 times more at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease than those without. So the reason why they think this is, is because this particular protein is not as good at breaking down the beta amyloid as the other variants. That being said, again, not a determinant. It just increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease at an earlier age. Okay. So then there was a 2002 study that I'm going to link to in the show notes that demonstrated that any of these APOE alleles plus a high serum cholesterol plus high blood pressure in midlife triple your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So again, 
I'm just going to beat this dead horse. Environment matters. Genetics aren't determinant, but they increase your risk. So cool. Are we are we solid on the ApoE4 gene? Yeah, I, th- and I think would... that you did that pretty well. Thank you. I think this stuff is kind the of biochem thingy. Yeah. <laughs> is that all for biochem? Uh, no, that's from like I took genetics, a lot of genetics courses in undergrad, and I really liked them. OK, that's good. Yeah. But anyway, so that I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page of like why this gene is considered important in the development of dementia. OK, cool. All right. With all that, we're on to the article. First, this is an open access article. It was published last month in PLOS One, that is Public Library of Science One, which has an impact factor of 2.806 in 2016. Pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. So there will also be a link to that in the show notes. There will also be a PDF in the SRP Game Changers Library. Speaking about available knowledge in Wikipedia, this is open source. Open source. So I'm going to start with the introduction. They bring up that 25% of the population has the E4 gene variant. So 47% of that 25%, they develop dementia. This indicates that there may be an environmental influence. So this study wanted to look at the environmental influence of positive age beliefs and their influence on development of dementia. So they bring up the point of modifiable versus non-modifiable factors. This is a modifiable factor that may influence this genetic expression. The things we know about ageism and positive age beliefs and negative age beliefs, positive age beliefs can lead to better cognitive performance and vice versa. Negative age beliefs can cause poor cognitive performance and predict the development of Alzheimer's disease biomarkers. Yeah, we've been through that in the first episode of the series. Yeah. So dementia is also likely related to stress and negative age stereotypes increase stress in older adults. The hypothesis of this study is that positive age beliefs will protect older individuals, including E4 carriers, from developing dementia, which is, like, bold. It is. I'm interested. All right. So on to the methods. Oh, any question before we we go to the methods? So just to recap, it's an article about how the environment influences the gene expression? Yes. And the environment specifically being positive or negative age beliefs. I am very interested. Go on. I love it when you say it like that. All right. So now the methods. (laughs) So the cohort of subjects are members of the Health and Retirement Study, which is a biennial survey of a diverse population of older Americans run by the University of Michigan Institute of Social Research. And it's actually we want to on the long list of things we want to do episodes about the Health and Retirement Study is on there. Yeah, because I mentioned it in the loneliness and the quality of life. Yeah. 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 There there are a lot of things we want to talk about. Also, go University of Michigan. Go Big Blue. Is that what people say? Go Blue. Oh, okay. So the cohort that they used at baseline were at least 60 years old. They were without dementia, which they defined as a score of seven or above on the TICS scale. So what is the TICS? It is the Telephone Interview for Cognitive Status Scale, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Man, okay. Yeah. If there was available data on the subject's age beliefs, the cognition, and the covariates, which is explained later, and they followed them up for four years. So then they talk about the APOE posterior probability scores of less than 0.8. So there are several things in that statement of criteria that I was like, so down the rabbit hole I went. (laughs) And to basically summarize what I found, the rationale behind it is that the posterior probability score is from Bayesian statistics. And listeners, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's a sort of random variable that's influenced by evidence from an experiment or a survey. So the HRS, and that's Health and Retirement Study, generated score is, quote, a measure of observed statistical information associated with the allele frequency estimate, which is a measure of single nucleotide polymorphism imputation quality. So to put it simply, it's a measure of how helpful the information we have is and helps us to determine whether or not it's useful for further analysis. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's above 0.8 is useful. Yes. And below Below it's garbage poop fire. 
less useful. (laughs) All right. The genotype was determined from saliva samples in either 2006 or 2008. And the NIH Center for Inherited Disease Research did the actual genotyping. So 26% of the participants were E4 carriers, which is about correct with um, the introduction saying about 25%. 7% of these were homozygous, meaning they had though both of the alleles were E4. 85% 85% were E4E3. Remember, E3 is the neutral type and doesn't really do anything. Yeah. And then 8% were E4E2. And the E2 is it's the good one that, for us. Yeah, exactly. The predictor that they used was positive age beliefs. And this was used using the five item attitude toward aging subscale of the Philadelphia Geriatric Center morale scale. So this ranges from five to 30, and a higher score indicates more positive age beliefs. Mm-hmm. And it has good internal and external validity, although no. Information about the reliability, but that's okay. Okay. I mean, take what we can get, right? So then the outcome of interest was the incidence of dementia. And this was assessed with the telephone interview for cognitive status mentioned earlier. It was done at baseline. It looks at short-term memory, delayed recall, and mathematical skills, and it was administered every two years. So this is a valid, reliable tool with little evidence of sealing or practice effects, and it has good sensitivity and specificity for identifying dementia. A score from zero to six indicates that someone has dementia. From 7 to 11, there's some sort of cognitive impairment, but no dementia. Mm -hmm. And 12 and above, no dementia. It's almost like a mocha, but a phone, an over-the-phone one. Exactly. So you can't really show a camel. Yeah, no, it's a little challenging. (laughs) No, I'm thinking of an animal. I'm thinking of an animal. (laughs) It has a horn. (laughs) And a hump. What? What? No, I was describing a a rhinoceros. Well, I think I just failed. I think my score is four. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, good. So then the covariates are things that relate to age beliefs and or dementia, which in this case are age, sex, race, education, marital status, smoking history, depression, cognitive performance, the E4 variant, and whether a healthcare provider had told the subjects that they have cardiovascular disease and or diabetes. So they took all these different covariates into account in their analysis because they have an influence on dementia and age beliefs. Also, I like how they said whether a medical professional told I thought that was really interesting. Instead of, you know, do they have uh, heart disease or vascular disease? Yeah. And and later they said people with cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So I don't know why they differentiated the wording in the methods and then not later. Okay. That's that's it's a little weird that they changed the wording. Yeah. But I'm glad you picked up on that because I thought that was weird. And they did some statistical magic that I would like a biostatistician to come explain to me. Awesome. <laughs> this is how it should be done. Yeah, like I, I tried. Salagadula, metricabula, bibidi bibidi do. And statistical. Logic. You are dusting off cobwebs in my brain. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Fancy stats. Talk to someone who knows more than me. I don't want to be telling you things that might be wrong. But just know that this is really important and I probably should understand it. And I'm a little embarrassed at myself for not getting it. All right. So. Anything before we go to the results? Those methods all make sense. So what did they do? (laughs) They took a bunch of people. Uh They measured their baseline cognitive status and their baseline age beliefs. Yeah, twice, like once every two years. Yes, exactly. And followed them for four years. Okay. And then um, measured those who had incident dementia. And wanted, they wanted to see if there was a difference. They also had the genetic material. Ooh, that sounds strange. Yeah, that's how did they get this? Ge- <laughs> so they, they did a, um, a buckle swab. It's part of the health and retirement study. I think they just took a bunch of data. Okay. Yeah, they have the genetic information. <laughs> Basically, they just like checked on them every two years. Yeah, for four years. Yeah. And looked at the changes over time. Okay. <laughs> that's all I wanted to... <laughs> Don't look at me like that. I was listening. I just wanted to make it clearer for our audience. That's fine. I do the same thing. Like I feel like if I can summarize something, it's easier and I understand it better. And others do too. Yeah. So it's very kind of you. No, thank you. No problem. Keep on going. Results. All right. So 
Positive age beliefs protected older individuals from developing dementia. This is an R squared value of 0.81, which is pretty gosh darn good, with a pretty, it's an okay confidence interval between 0.67 and 0.97, and the p value was 0.03. So this is when they adjusted for age, education, sex, race, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, baseline cognitive status, and the epsilon-4 gene. So persons with positive age beliefs, risk of dementia over four years was 2.6%. Persons with negative age beliefs, risk of dementia is 4.61%. And that's without taking genetics into account. That's just everyone in the population, approximately 2.6% if they have positive age beliefs, and it's about double if you have negative age beliefs. It's like, you know that song... When you believe it's Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey. There can be miracles. Yes. So those are just people not even looking at the E4 gene yet. Okay. So then you look at the people who are E4 carriers with the same adjustments. Our square value was a little lower. It was 0.69. Confidence interval was a little wider. It was 0.5 to 0.94. The p-value was a little lower, so 0.018. So the people with the E4 variant, this is people at higher risk of dementia, if they had positive aging beliefs, they had a 2.17% likelihood of developing dementia. That is less than the whole population. So then people with negative beliefs had a 6.14% chance. I know it tripled their risk of developing dementia. And then if they have the positive beliefs, they're out there with the rest of the population, even slightly below it. This is just like, I believe things. It's the little demented that could. I (laughs) think I can. I think I can. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's weird. <laughs> no, like it's uh, man, it's, it's awesome. bonkers. I just also imagine someone just like like in the like waking up in the morning, standing like this, saying, "I don't have dementia." <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "Oh, it's it's not that they don't have dementia; it's that they have positive, positive age." Positive yeah. It's like being old is awesome. Reduces your risk of dementia. Three times over. Everything is awesome, including dementia. No, no it's no, not. No, what? No. <laughs> Dementia's not awesome. <laughs> Everything is awesome, including it by this. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Okay, so yeah, having the positive age beliefs put the persons with the genetic risk at the same level as those without, which is insane. It is insane. Yeah, you can look at this yourself in the paper. It's like, it, it blew my mind. Wow, mind blown. Yes. So, okay. Anything about the results you want to talk about before we go on to the discussion? Mind blown, but not by E4. <laughs> oh, I get it. That's good. All right. So on to the discussion. So they made the point that these positive age beliefs can have a protective factor against dementia over four years even with the increased risk from the presence of the APOE E4 gene. So you lessen the influence of E4 likely as a later life epigenetic process involved with a reduced stress leading to altered gene expression. So a limitation is that dementia could influence these age beliefs, but they say probably not because they tend to start from childhood. We're talking about both genetic and upbringing and environment. And I think that people that had healthier parents when they grew old mm-hmm. or, you know, were in an environment when they saw old people as, as a healthy example, it's both genetic because, you know, they are my parents, so I have some of their genes. Yeah. But also you see people and you grow old and you see people at 75 working and, you know, not being at home all day, maybe like once a week playing bridge. Maybe. So, yeah, man, I like this study. It's so cool, right? (laughs) Man, Dr. Levy. Yeah, really I cool. you're you're my girl crush now. <laughs> Dr. Levy, if you listen to this podcast, we want to hang out with you. Yeah, just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's pretty much it for the discussion. I just wanted to bring up things that I wish they had discussed. So they talked about how in this cohort of people, there were people with different like homozygous versus heterozygous versus like different types of heterozygosity. And they didn't talk about anything in the results that had to do with that. And I just wonder if the incidence of dementia varied across those different presentations, Mm. 
which I mean, even if it didn't, I would still be interested in like a sentence about that. They brought it up. That's great. And then that was it. It was like, and that is information. We did nothing with this. Yeah. You made me read about genetics and you didn't <laughs> use it. Whoops. <laughs> right? <laughs> didn't use any of it. You tricked me. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I have for this episode. Tali, do you have any any questions, any things you want to talk about? No, just it was great. Right? I We should believe more in positive thinking. I know that we're like sometimes want to be hard scientists or... And cynics. But yeah, we sh- it, may- it made me made my heart warmer. All right. Well, thank you to all the Senior Ea podcast listeners for listening to us blather on about these things. We also want to thank the Game Changers for all they do to help us do the things that we do. Including asking for a series about things. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. They did this. I want to thank Dustin and Troy and Nicole for being awesome teammates. Man, yes, they are. Thank you again for listening. Uh, I'm Aaron Carey. I'm Tally Spaceman. As always, stay, stay funky. funky. Hit me. Thank you for listening to the Senior Rehab Podcast. If you only listen to these podcast episodes, you are missing out on 90% of the Senior Rehab Project. Hop on over to SeniorRehabProject.com where you can join the movement that's advancing care for older adults. You can join for free or become a part of the Game Changers where you can get some free gear and access to our monthly meetup. Just go to SeniorRehabProject.com. I appreciate y'all, and I'll talk with you soon. But in the meantime, do not forget to stay funky.